Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good enough. We're ready to start program number four this afternoon, and I guess I should remind our television audience, we are presently in book number 47. Remembering now, we put 12 programs in one book, so we are in book number 47, and we are in the last four programs, and it's the last program of the day. So after today, number 47 is finished, right? So uh, those of you out in television, if you want to call, you can find out about the tapes and the books and so forth. That's, uh, that's our numbers. Okay, where am I? I had such a bad ending last time, <laughs> I'm going to start out with a bad beginning, but whatever. For those of you in television, we're glad you've joined us, and uh, we trust that many of you has already written. You feel like you're right back there in the audience someplace. And, uh, you know, when we first started all this several years ago, as we were talking to the guys up here, and I said, well, I'll come on television. It wasn't my idea, it was theirs. I said, I'll come on television if I can have a classroom setting like I'm used to teaching, if we can have tables and chairs, and uh, oh yeah, we can do all that. So that's where we first got the idea that uh, we wanted a, uh, a classroom setting, and uh, you'd be surprised how many people comment that that's what they like about it, that it's just like an old college classroom, that uh, they can sit with their textbook and uh, make notes and so forth. So anyway, the Lord... Uh, has been blessing it. All right, now let's get back into Hebrews chapter 3 and uh, try to uh, recover a little bit of the shambles of the end of our last program. But uh, we'll start in Hebrews chapter 3 where we left off from in verse 7. <clears throat> Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of that temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers... Now remember, Paul is writing to Hebrews, so he's referring all the way back to the forefathers of Israel. When your fathers tempted, or tested is a better word, tested me and proved me and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. And I said, they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now we have to take the next verse to pick up God's number one controversy with the human race as well as Israel, as I pointed out in the last program. So he says, take heed, brethren, verse 12, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief. Now he doesn't mention any of the other sins of the flesh, but unbelief. Oh, it's what God hates more than anything, is a lack of faith. All right? So he says, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief, and when there is no faith, then it's an easy step to do what? Depart from the living God. Now you've heard me say it on the program over the last several years. Now you can come back with me to Exodus 23. <clears throat> what is America's number one problem? And it's not politics, it's not economics, it's spiritual. And what is it? We've lost our faith. As a nation of people, we no longer have any respect for the absolutes of this book. And we're suffering the consequences. Restore America back to the faith of our fathers and most of our problems will disappear. But they will not, because they will not believe what God says. Well, here is the lesson for us now from Israel's experience going into the promised land. Now during break time I just drew a makeshift map and a lot of people think <clears throat> that the promised land is just this little neck between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley. Well nothing could be further from the truth and we'll be seeing that in a little bit. But they came from down here in Mount Sinai in the Arabian Desert 
And they came up to Kadesh, and yes, this was where they were going to go first, was up through the fertile area of what we presently call the land of Israel, or uh, secularizing it, it's the land of Palestine. But you see, the promised land was everything from the river of Egypt, around the Mediterranean, up past Mount Hermon, all the way to the Euphrates River, clear out to the Gulf of Persia, and back around to the Red Sea and over to the river of Egypt. That's the promised land, not this. This. Now, I was just reading a book again the other day, and do you know that according to the Balfour Agreement of 1918, when Great Britain first agreed to give Israel a homeland, this is about what they had drawn out. Just about all of this. Not quite, but just about. But you see, it wasn't very long until they start having second thoughts, and so they pulled all that away and made Jordan, and then they gave Israel what we now presently think of as the land of Israel. But listen, the promised land is that whole Middle East out to the Euphrates River. And I'll show you here in just a little bit. All right, coming into Exodus 23. Where do we have to stop? Verse 25, you shall serve the Lord your God, you shall bless, he shall bless thy bread and thy water. I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Verse 26, here we come now with all the material and earthly blessings. Nothing shall cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before thee. I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. I will make your enemies turn their back. Now, what does that mean? Here, they're going to run. They're going to be running out ahead of them. Now, verse 28. God says, I will send hornets before thee. Now, listen, I don't care if the Canaanites were 12 feet tall. Could they withstand a hive of hornets? No way. I don't care how big they were. God says, I'll send hornets and it'll just drive them out. Can you picture it? And God meant business. He said, this is what I'll do. I'll drive the Canaanites. You won't even have to lift a sword. All you got to do is walk in behind it and settle down. Now let's read on. I will send hornets before thee, which will drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out before thee in one year. In other words, I'm not going to drive them out so fast that you can't pick up taking care of their vineyards and their orchards and so forth. We'll go it slow enough so that you can take over and cultivate and keep everything going. All right? The beast of the field will, uh, lest the beast of the field multiply against thee. Verse 30, by little and little, I will drive them out, God says, from before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. My, what promises. I will set thy bounds, now here it comes, I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea, which is down here on the south, remember. Your border will be from the Red Sea even to the Sea of the Philistines, which is the Mediterranean, and from the desert to the river, which is the great river Euphrates. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land in your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Now with all this goodness being spread before thee, here's the admonition, verse 32. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make you sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will be a snare unto thee. All right, now let's go over to Deuteronomy a moment. And Deuteronomy, remember, is sort of a book of review where Moses just sort of recaps everything that has happened. Deuteronomy chapter 1. 
And oh my goodness, I always have a hard time deciding where to jump in because this is all good. Oh, this is all good. If you want to have an interesting evening of reading, just read the book of Deuteronomy. It is one portion of scripture that is almost like a story. It just flows. And it's not hard to understand. All right, but let's just jump in at, uh, oh, verse 6, chapter 1. Let's just jump in at verse 6. No, I've got to go back up to verse 2. <laughs> Sorry about that. Here's where I was referring to in the last half hour. Just 11 days' journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh. 11 days. And then they could have started taking the promised land, and they could have occupied it, and they could have had all the goodness of it. But like I pointed out, instead of 11 days, how long was it until Joshua brought them in across Jordan? 40 years. So they stretched 11 days into 40 years. Because of what? Unbelief. All right, back up to chapter 1. Might as well start at verse 2. There are 11 days' journey from Horeb, that is Mount Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. See how plain that is? I mean, you don't have to be a seminary graduate to understand that. 11 days from Mount Sinai to Kadesh. Verse 3, And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment, after he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon and Og, and so on and so forth, on this side, that is, on the east side of Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, or this book of Deuteronomy. All right, now look what he says. The Lord your God, verse 6, The Lord your God spake unto us in Horeb, at Mount Sinai, after they had received the instructions for the tabernacle. And the Lord said, You have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you, take your journey, and go to the mount of the Amorites, and all the places nigh therein to, in the plain, in the hills, in the vale, in the south, by the sea, to the land of the Canaanites, unto Lebanon, which is up toward Mount Hermon on my map, unto the great river, which one? Euphrates. See, I don't want somebody to say, well, where do you get us the Euphrates River? No, this is what the Scripture says over and over, that it's the Euphrates River that would be their boundary, and then down to the Red Sea and over to the Sea of the Philistines. All right, now let's just compare before we go any further here in Deuteronomy. Let's go back to Genesis. Now, I'll probably run out of time again. Genesis, chapter 15. Because I don't want you to think, well, Moses was just being real normal and all of a sudden his ambition got the best of him and so he concocted the idea that they could have the whole Middle East. No, this is what God deeded. It's been deeded to them. Genesis 15, verse 18. Genesis 15, verse 18. <coughs> Oh, got it? In the same day that God came down and fulfilled a title deed with Abraham, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed, his offspring, generations down the road, unto thy seed I have given this land. So we're not talking about something spiritual. We're talking about physical terra firma. I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. You see how plain that is? There's no arguing. He's giving them everything from the river of Egypt, and I'll even give you a little fudge. I don't think it's the Nile. I think there was another one east of the Nile a few miles that sort of uh, disappeared over time, but whatever. It was the river of Egypt all along the Mediterranean up to the river Euphrates and as we saw back in, uh, in the other account that it went to the Red Sea in Deuteronomy. All right, but I want you to see that this is what God himself deeded to Abraham. 
All right, come on back with me now to Deuteronomy. Verse 8. Behold, God says, I have set the land before you. What land? The promised land that God has already prepared through the sweat and tears of the Canaanites. Go in and possess it, the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. See? Now then, I'm going to have to forsake a time, bring you all the way up to verse 18. <clears throat> now, I want you to see what Moses is showing. That when the children of Israel left Mount Sinai with everything set to go in and occupy the land, they now had the priesthood set up, the Levitical priesthood. They had the tabernacle built with all of the, the floor plan that followed up later in the temple. Everything was now ready for God's covenant people to enter into a place of bliss, joy, no bloodshed. As long as they were obedient, God would bless them. My, it was no wonder the promised land. Everything was waiting for them. All right, now read on. Verse 18. And Moses says, I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. Now remember, they're under law. And law says, do this, and I'll bless you. Do that, and I'll bless you. Don't do this, and don't do that. That was the law. All right, so Moses rehearsed that. Now verse 19. Now he says, when we departed from Horeb, that is, Mount Sinai. We went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. Now, I wish everybody could just be familiar with that term. Kadesh Barnea was the gateway to the promised land. That's what it's best called. It was the gateway to the promised land. And God brought them up that 11 days journey and he sets them there and he says, go in and take it. It's ready for you. Don't have to raise a sword. You won't have to worry about losing a single young man. I'll drive them out with what? Hornets. See? Now read on. Verse 20. And I said unto you, you are come un, unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Verse 21, Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Now stop a minute and think. <coughs> what did God nor Moses tell the children of Israel? What did he not tell them? Come on, you're not thinking. He didn't say a word about sending in 12 spies. Did he? No. Come on, think. He hasn't said a word about sending in spies to see if they can do it. He says, take my word for it. Go in and take it. There won't be one item of opposition. Go take it. What does unbelief say? Ooh, but wait a minute. Aren't you even going to let us check it out and see if we can make it? That's unbelief. But that's exactly what Israel did. And that's where God's anger began to begin. Now, he agreed to it. Now, I know. He condescended and he says, okay. Okay, if that will make it easier for you, I'll let you pick one man out of each of the 12 tribes and you can send them in and spy out the land. The biggest mistake Israel ever made. Why? 
because the majority report came back 10 to 2 and said what? Can't do it. Now, what did I say years and years ago in this program? When it comes to the things of the Spirit, the majority is usually, I didn't say always, usually wrong. Mark it up. The majority are usually wrong. Look at Christendom today. It has become a works religion for the majority of people. And don't tell me that that makes them right. So the 12 spies go in. They search out the land. All right, let's just read on. And so Moses says, verse 22, You came, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up into what cities we shall come. What God say? It's all yours. Go take it. What did Israel say? How? <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? But see, this is unbelief at work. And so the first step down in unbelief was, says, okay, let's spy out the land first, and then we'll go and take it. No, unbelief is a downhill slide on a banana peel, and it is almost irrevocable. And this is a good example. All right, let's read on. Uh, verse 23. Now, even Moses. Here was one of Moses' weak points. Moses should have been able to stand up and say, Now look, our God has said it's ours for the taking. We don't have to put spies in there. But Moses condescended and agreed, see? And he says, the, verse 23, The saying pleased me well. So I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain and came to the valley of Eshcol and searched it out. They took the fruit of the land in their hands. Now, the first thing I imagine anybody that has been to Israel, especially until the last few years, you go to the land of Israel and you think, what in the world was God thinking when he told Israel they could have a land flowing with milk and honey? It, it almost looks like something that anybody would be glad to run away from. Now, of course, we're seeing it blossom like a rose. But you see, Israel... I know the first time Iris and I were over there was in 1975, and the first thing we said, what in the world did God think when he said he could give them this promised land? It was barren. It was a wilderness. In fact, I have an article in the back of my Bible. I haven't got time to read it today. But Mark Twain reported in 1860 that it was absolutely barren. It was uninhabitable. He said, we drove for miles and never saw a living creature. And he said, we went up to Jerusalem. He said, it was just a heartache of despair. There's nothing there. That was Mark Twain. Now, he wouldn't lie. But, you see, when God showed it to Israel, it was a veritable garden flowing indeed with milk and honey. All right, now read on. They took the fruit of the land in their hands. Verse 25, reading on, And they brought us word of God and said, It is a good land, which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, you would not go up. Now remember, Moses is rehearsing all this. This is a reveal. But Moses said, Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. They what? They rebelled. Rebellion. And you said, because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and to destroy us. Where shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great, walled to heaven. A lie. What did they rather believe, the truth or the lie? Well, the lie. That's the same way today. See, that's what Paul means in Romans when he says, all these things are written for our what? Learning. See, you won't find the plan of salvation back here, but my goodness, you can find a gold mine of learning. And what's the example? The world hasn't changed one bit. 
They'll flock for the lie by the millions. And you hold up the truth, and they scorn it. They scorn it. Many of you have experienced it. You try to bring truth into your Sunday school class, and they just about kick you out the back door. Not all, but a lot of them. Well, it's exactly the way it's always been. And so here's Israel with the truth of God in front of them, but they'd rather believe the lie of ten men. I mean, it's enough to make you weep, but that's the human race, see? All right. Now, let's see. We've got three minutes left. Let's just keep going. Verse 29. Then Moses said, I said unto you, Dread not, don't be afraid of them. The Lord your God who goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Now, goodness sakes, what happened in Egypt? Well, the plagues. And God put a line around Goshen, an invisible wall that the flies didn't penetrate. With the exception of the first three or four, none of the plagues touched Israel. When the death angel flew with the blood on the doorpost, not a Jew lost his life, not a one. And so Moses is saying, the same God that brought you out of Egypt opened the Red Sea. And if he could open the Red Sea, he can certainly drive out Canaanites. But, oh, they couldn't believe it. Now, isn't this sad? I mean, it's enough to just break your heart if you really get into it. And then they stand there in abject unbelief and say, No, God, you don't mean what you tell us. When you talk to us, you lie. That's basically what they're saying, see? All right, verse 30. No, verse 31. And Moses goes on, And in the wilderness, when they were out there on the desert, where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place? What was he talking about? He provided water out of the rock. He provided the daily manna. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. Everything was provided by God. Now I've got to stop at the next verse, verse 32. Yet in this thing you did not, what's the word? Believe! How much can I say it any better? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-78